I'm going to ask you to either take your Bibles out or turn your Bibles on to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're just going to look at two, two verses this morning. And I hope that uh, when you came into church this morning, you received a, a coin, you received a, a penny. And we're going to talk about this penny. We're going to look at both sides of this penny. And we're going to explain that a little bit later on uh, today. But how many of, of you heard that expression, there are two sides to every coin? Two sides to every coin, two sides to every story. And you know what? If we just look at one side of the coin, it can get very discouraging. If our perspective is only, let's say, what we see as we look at this coin, and I'm looking at heads, and all I see is that, and I never understand or never turn the coin over and know that there's something else there, it can get pretty depressing. The enemy can start playing with our minds. This, mo- this, this week, the last three days, I kind of got myself trapped in, in that very state of thinking. Last week, my wife, she took off to minister in Romania. She's doing two major women's conferences in Romania. She was really, really sick when she left. We were on the phone for at least an hour after church yesterday. I mean, excuse me, last Sunday, trying to think if she should cancel because she was so sick. And, uh, you know, she, she per- persevered and she went on and she was calling me and talking to me. And, and uh, I mean, even up to last night, she called me. Um, it's seven hours earlier, later there, so she called me at two in the morning her time and literally felt that she was going to pass out because she was coughing uh, so much and she got, she got afraid. And uh, so that was something I was dealing with. My boy is uh, in Toronto. He's trying to decide about ministry, whether he should go into the ministry or business or both. And he had a rough couple of days. And <sighs> so there I was looking at that one side of the coin. And of course, you take up for your kids. And I was trying to encourage him, trying to talk to him. But I kind of felt the weight of that, the pressure of that. My daughter's car, um, air conditioner went out, and so she's dying, of course, of heat in the car, and I said, just roll the windows down, but, you know, it doesn't work, and, and she, you know, so I was trying to, to, to help her and encourage her, and, and then on Thursday, I, uh, I was planning for about two months um, to go see the Baltimore Yankee game, and I'm a Yankee fan, so I apologize, but uh, hey, if you don't like it, uh, thank you, someone is excited. <laughs> so, uh, so I was all excited um, to take this trip, and I left work and <coughs> got, made sure I got my outline in and did everything I had to do, and so it was about a three and a half hour trip up there. You know, when you book something way in advance, I, d- I forgot it was going to be Memorial Day, so we had a seven o'clock game, and got to Baltimore, I had, we, we had a rush uh, to eat, and so I was rushing to eat, and it's a nice restaurant, so, you know, when you have nice food, you want to enjoy it, but I'm sitting there gobbling it down, and run to the stadium, we get to the stadium, and the, the gates are closed, so I, I'm walking up, I'm thinking in my mind, well, you know, um, we're 20 minutes late, because you know, we tried to eat dinner, and, and I said, we're probably, you know, maybe there's another entrance. So there's a gentleman there, and he was kind of cleaning up around uh, the front of the gate. And I said, hey, what gate do we go in for t- to the game? And he's like, what game? I said, the New York game, the Yankee game. Because it was, it was, it was, I thought it was at 7 o'clock. He said, oh, that game was at 1235. It's over. <laughs> exactly. And my... I was, I was so <laughs> mad is not, I mean, what I was thinking, I can't even say <laughs> today from the pulpit. So I, I, I was so upset. I was so disappointed. Um, you know, I was, I was looking forward to it. 
And again, my focus now is like, you know, what else? What, what else could, could take place? You know, and, 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 you know, a lot of times when we look at one side of, of the coin, the weight of the world um, begins to, to, to focus and gets on our shoulders. And, and, you know, whatever it is, whether it's financial pressure or, or workloads or deadlines or guilt you're trying to work through, sometimes our perspective is only one-sided. And, and, you know, we look for the answer, but all we hear in our mind many times from the enemy is, hey, you just need to get over it. Hey, just, just, just work it out. Just do it. You know what, Dale? You need to figure this out. Or, or you know what, you got to get, you got to get over yourself, and you just need to grow up. Pull up your big boy pants, pull up your big girl pants, and just, just move off. And then I got home, and I was beginning to review the scripture that I'm going to share with you today, and to top it all off, Paul, the apostle Paul, has to stab me right in the back. When I'm feeling down, I'm like, you know what? I don't know what in the world I'm going to, this is just overwhelming. And then I read in verse 12 at the end of the verse, Paul says to me, hey, work out your own salvation. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, what, what, what are you talking about? And this is what he says. And, and really, this is a confusing statement to many people, especially when we look only at one side of the coin. When that is our perspective. When that is our thinking. So, when it comes to Christian growth, how do we develop by working on our relationship with the Lord? Is it, is it by ourselves? Or by letting go and allowing God to do in our lives what we cannot do for ourselves. So this morning, I want to I look at the equation this way. Is it faith in God, or is it our effort that causes us to develop in Christ, to grow up in Christ, to, to mature? And I think Paul solves this problem by looking at two sides of the coin. So we have to look at both sides. And here's one thing I want you to remember. Our effort plus God's touch equals a greater life. Equals greater joy. That inner joy that is supernatural. That we just can't conjure up ourselves. And I believe God is working in our lives. I know he's working in mine. I mean, there is a strong desire in me to grow deeper in God. To, to, to look at my mistakes, to not look at one side of the coin, to grow stronger, to get more out of this thing called life because I want my life to count. I want my life to count. I want it to count in my marriage. I want it to count as a father. I want it to count as a pastor. I want it to count as a person. I want my life to matter. And in order to do this, we have to really grasp what Paul is talking about here. So we're going to look at the first side of the coin. So I want everyone to take out their little penny. Take out your penny if you got it as you came in here. And I want you to look at the head part of the penny. So that's what we're going to talk about first. We're going to look at the first side of the coin. Here's what the first side of the coin means. Our effort brings excitement to our mission. Okay? Our effort brings excitement to our mission. If we are going to know Christ more, there are some things we need to understand to encourage that process. And Paul gives us three, and we're going to break it down into three words. The first is example. Example. In verse 12, he says this in the latter part of the verse, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, in this particular instance, 
it signals a conclusion to what Paul has already written to us in verses 5 through 11. So let's look at that in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, through, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the father so what's he what paul is saying is christ is our example he's our example that word therefore if you've been at river of life church any amount of time you know that when we study the word of god and you see the word therefore you ask this question what is it there for and you go read back so you don't take things out of context so you don't misunderstand what God is trying to speak to your heart. And so Paul says, therefore, since you have seen, this is what he's talking about, since you have seen the example of Christ, since you know what a Christian is supposed to be, how a Christian is supposed to act, therefore, this is what you need. This is what you and I need to do. Christian growth begins with understanding who Jesus is and how Jesus lived. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, I mean, this is a man who Peter put his foot in his mouth a lot of times. This is a man who cursed the name of Jesus Christ and denied him. And so he has an understanding and he recognizes, okay, I need to realize that Christ is my example. Because Peter was just looking at one side of the coin until God really changed his perspective to be three-dimensional. So he says this in 1 Peter 2.21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you, watch this, an example, so that you might follow in his steps. We know that Christ was, an, was compassion. He was full of compassion. Maybe this morning we need to walk out of here with more compassion for people. Jesus Christ was selfless. Maybe that's an area where we have to take responsibility and we have to let him be, in our, be our example and to be selfless. Maybe we need to love people with a greater capacity. Maybe there's people that are different than us, different in our political thinking, different in skin color, different because of their sexuality. And so we have this this. this, this disdain for them and we think that they are different or lesser or not as 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 good as we are and that is not like christ at all so maybe we need to come and increase our love we need to be more like christ we need to work out our salvation and this is what he is saying. Maybe we need to walk out here, out of here with a greater passion for prayer. Why? Because Christ was our example. Working out our salvation, being involved, means understanding what we are working on. And then the second word is responsibility. Work out your own salvation, he says, with fear and trembling. You say, Dale, what, is, what does that mean, really? Well, some would say that it means to work for your salvation. Others says, will say it means to work at your salvation. But salvation is not by works. We cannot earn a place in heaven. We don't get a spot in eternity with Christ by what we do. We know that because Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says this, for it, has been, for it is grace that you have been saved through faith. Then he goes on and says, this is not of your own doing. 
This is a gift. It's a gift from God so that, so that no, one, no one would boast. In other words, salvation comes by faith and faith alone. So it can't mean that we are to work on trying to be saved. Paul is saying we are to work out our salvation, and that word work out is used in the secular Greek language of of mining. It's a mining term. In other words, you have this big piece of, of rock and you know there's jewels in it, a diamond or a ruby or gold, and that person had to, to keep chipping away at it because they knew that something was in there of value. And so they worked and worked and worked. They mined out that jewel, that gem, that valuable, extracting that out of that rock. So... so At salvation, God then takes up residence in us. When we say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want to be new. I want to be refreshed. I want to give my life to you. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, hey, your body now is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You now are not your own. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, it says this. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit now. Why? Because you have asked Jesus to come into your heart. When you do, that means you are saved. So he's talking about salvation. Then he says, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ is not saved. In other words, they don't have this salvation now the struggle for the christian is to take what is inside of us and let it come to life on the outside are you following me so people can see it so and and this is a struggle i mean this is not easy so this is what he's talking about on the first part of the coin we are trying to extract All that is in us that is Christ-like, that is good. And it takes work to do. For instance, today, this, again, you heard the the couple days I had. So I came back from Baltimore. (coughs) Five and a half hours, did I say that? Already? How long it took me? I'm a little bitter. Five and a half hours took me to get home. And I'm just like, I'm trying to hold it all in, whatever. I'm, and, and my wife's gone, so um, my kids are both gone. Gabrielle's doing something in, in New York, and uh, Christian, like I said, is in Toronto. And So I said, well, go good. At least I'm just, it's me and the dog. Just got to relax. And I said, you know what? I need a pizza. You, got, you know, have that ever happened? I need, I just, I need a good pizza. <laughs> so... So I'm, I, all right, I'm got to go down. I, I get it down in Route 3, so I, 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 I said, well, i got to go downtown. I didn't feel like getting in the car, but I said, you know what, I'm going to get in the car. So I'm going down Route 1, going the speed limit, minding my own business. And, and here comes this car behind me, like the Lord only knows how fast he was going. He comes behind me, and I see him in my rearview mirror. He pulls to the side and speeds right by me. So I'm like, hey, good for you. You know, keep wherever you got to go. I thought he had somewhere to go in a hurry. He passes me and cuts right over back in the lane. I'm in the slow lane. And I'm like, what? And again, I can't say what I was wanting to say. But everything in me just wanted to flip him off and just, I was so, I was like, dude, you don't, I missed the Yankee game. And, and I, you are, you don't want to mess with me today. Because the flesh is out, I don't have my pastor hat on, and I'm going to, and I, and I, and I pushed, I, I, I had my car, I, I pushed the gas, and I'm, I was actually going after this guy. I was, go, and so, I, <laughs> and I was going out, because I said, you know what, just one punch in the face, and I'll be fine, I'll punch him in the face, and I'll calm down, and I'll be okay. And I'm, I'm revving that gas. I'm coming right up on his bumper. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the Spirit of God's like, what, what, what are you doing? 
you know, he was in behind you. So he probably saw your River of Life sticker that's on your window. And now you've got to jump. You've got to beat somebody up now. <laughs> At 52 years old, you've got to beat somebody up. <laughs> what do you got to do? And, and all of a sudden, this portion of Scripture was, was coming to my mind about just focusing on this, this one side of the coin and, and being Christ-like and, and really following who he is. And I begin to think, you know, I need to work out my salvation. Why? So people can see it. Not so people can see my anger, see my frustration, see my discouragement, see, see, see my depression, see, see my, my anxiety. God, you need to help me. You need to do something in me. And you know, it takes a lot of effort, church. It takes effort to be a generous giver. It takes effort to forgive somebody. It takes effort to serve when you've worked 60 hours a week and, and then you're supposed to serve. You're supposed to give. You're, 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 you're supposed to be like Christ. You're supposed to rejoice by choice. I'm telling you, in that car moment, I did not want to rejoice by choice. But Paul says, if you, Dale, are now a new person on the inside, please, please be a new person on the outside. Work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. You say, Dale, how do I do it? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.25, Every athlete exercise self-control, which, good goodness, I lost it. Self-control, watch this, in all things. That, that word exercise, or some translations have training in your Bibles. Um, it's gumno in the, in the Greek, means gymnasium. So it, it's this concept of working, training, trying to get better, Listen, you don't win, and this is the context of what Paul was saying in Corinthians. You don't win the Olympics by just hanging around. You don't win the gold medal. You don't win the prize by going after something half-heartedly. Is that not true? No matter what we do in life. If we want to win, if we want to truly work out our salvation, then we have to go into strict training. What does it take for them, and what does it take for us, for Christian maturity? Discipline. Dedication. Passion. It takes us, which we've got to see in a minute, looking at both sides of the coin. You see, the fact of the matter is we always want God to l deliver us, but we never want God to discipline us. And it takes that. It takes effort if we are going to grow in the Lord. And Paul says again in verse 25, hey, you have these athletes that, that train their body. They train it so much, and all they get is prestige. They get this leaf, he says, this wreath that goes around their head. And yeah, they get the glory and the accolades from everyone in the stadium, but then that wreath dies. It's, it's perishable. But as you and I are working out our salvation, this is something, he says, that is imperishable. He says this in verse 26. So, because that's true, I do not run aimlessly. If I call myself a Christian, I'm not just aimlessly trying to see what God wants me to do. I'm focused. I'm ready. I'm, 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 I'm doing things because I, I take, I'm taking this seriously. He says, I don't box as one beating the air but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Watch this. Lest after preaching to others, I find myself wanting to flip someone off and punch their lights out. What would have happened if I did that? What would have happened if I let my emotions override my conviction that day? I could have lost years of influence 
I could have lost years of influence, years of training. Listen, when you get tired of your spouse and you want to have that affair, you better think twice. You're going to lose years. You're going to lose years. And this is what Paul's saying. Listen, I got to keep focus because I don't, I, I don't want to find myself disqualified. I don't want to find myself disqualified. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 7. Rather, train yourself in godliness. Ephesians 6, 12 says, listen, remember, we don't, we don't operate by flesh and blood. There is a spiritual battle, I'm paraphrasing this, there is a spiritual battle going on because the enemy does not want me does not want you to work out our salvation he wants us to see one side of the coin where we're so frustrated with life that we throw in the towel because it's too hard it's too much to be a christian there's so much discipline there's so much training i gotta keep going and every day and every day i gotta get back i gotta grow and grow and grow i'm tired of growing i just want to relax i just want to live And we're not talking about rules that shackle us. We're talking about love from Christ that frees us. We just got done talking in the last six weeks of of Matthew chapter 5 of the Beatitudes where God says, I want to give you joy and here's how you do it. I want you to be happy and here's how you do it. In fact, John 10.10 says this, I came. Do you remember we've been, remember this verse? We've been saying it, what, for six, seven weeks? This is God's heart. I came so that you may have life. I came so you may have life and have it everlasting. I want you to succeed. And you can't look at just one side of the coin. Listen, our walk with Christ demands maximum attention. I mean, we will see positive change in our lives when we realize our effort plus God's touch equals a greater life, equals greater joy. And how is it that Paul, just one man, accomplished so much for the Lord? It is because he learned to look at both sides of the coin. He was given all of his effort. He was working out his salvation. I think of my mom and dad building five churches in, in Alaska. And now that I'm older, I, look, I can look back and think, boy, my mom walked out of Cherry Hill, Cherry Hill uh, New Jersey, and, and it was, it's a nice area. My dad walked out of New York to Toke, Alaska, where it's 60 below zero. My mom in her 20s, going from that, having to, to walk out almost 100 yards to just go to the bathroom, freezing to death in the winter. And now, now that I'm in ministry, thinking of all the things they had to walk through, and I take my hat off to them. I have great respect for our missionaries around the world and our missionaries here in America and what they do and how they do it. Listen, we have to be kingdom-minded, and if we're kingdom-minded, we will be kingdom builders. Are you following me? I mean, this is important. I think of Billy Graham. I just got reading, got got done reading his autobiography a couple months ago. And it didn't just happen. This is a man who had to work out his salvation. On Monday and Tuesday, I was in Minnesota at a at a convention, a a church leadership convention, and, and this one gentleman who I never heard speak before, I never even knew him. His name was Levi Lusco, and this is a man who, who planted churches and started in Montana. Now he has churches all over Montana, all over Wyoming, all over Oregon, all over Utah. Utah. And I think of this, I said, how, how does this one person do this? How is this possible? And it's because they gave and they're willing to give their very best all the time. And here's what they're willing to sacrifice. They're willing to sacrifice what Jesus asked all of us to sacrifice, and that is sacrifice ourselves. Didn't he say, seek first me. Seek first the kingdom. Dale, do that, and then 
I'm going to show you the other side of the coin. Seek first the kingdom of God. How's it go? And then all other things will be added unto us. Listen, it's really important for us to get a hold of this. We will see life change our results when we realize God's effort plus God's touch equals greater joy. There's a third word for this first part, and that's commitment. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior today, the fact is you have a lot riding on this. And if you don't, and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then at the end of the message, hey, you get a chance to do it. And if you accept him as your Savior today, then you too will have a lot riding on life. And the commitment is fierce. The commitment is fierce. He, he says in verse 12, Therefore, church, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation. Here's two great words, with fear and trembling. Fear is phobos in the Greek. We get our word phobia from it. And the word for trembling is traumos. In other words, what he's saying, as you work this out, understand how serious, how important this, this acceptance of salvation really is. He's saying, hey, let's get fired up about our lives and what we can do for Christ because it's in you. It's in me. We have to mine it out. We have to chip away at who Dale Donatio is. I have to chip away at my temper and my, my composure of who I am to get discouraged really quick. You may not know that about me, but I can get really discouraged really quick. I don't like that about me. And I'm not the kind of guy who wants to be all happy-go-lucky when, when, when I'm hurting inside. I want to tell somebody, hey, I'm hurting. This is what I'm going through. But I also have to be able to work out my salvation. I have to keep chipping away at it. Yeah. All effort, maximum effort. I got to train. I got to get better yeah. just to get better. No, to give God glory out of my life. To show God, hey, I'm not going to punch this guy out. I'm not going to make an idiot of myself because someone cut me off. Church, let's be all in. Isn't that one of our values here at River of Life? Isn't one of our values being wholehearted? That means we got a maximum effort. Maximum effort. Let's not let our Christianity be another add-on to our life. Because lack of commitment means lack of growth. And remember the answer to the equation. Our effort plus God's touch equals a greater life. It equals greater joy. And you may be here this morning and say, Hey, Dale, you need to take a chill pill, man. You're getting way too serious about this stuff. Just chill out. Get an ice cream or something. Just relax. Listen, I take it seriously because God desires us to be the best version we can be. And some of us, probably all of us, need to do a little bit better. To be the best version that God created you to be. God has a purpose. We know he has a plan for our lives let's not lose that all in respect for the fear of the lord he loves us he has compassion for us and i'm all for finding uh, new ways to promote the gospel i'm all for having fun but in all the hype of packaging the gospel for entertainment value i fear that we are doing what one author said we are amusing ourselves to death as a church the Lord wants us to live life to the fullest. And that means we have to work out our salvation. All right. Now, take your penny. Turn it over and I want you to look at the back side of that penny. That's the tail part, right? 
We looked at the heads part. Now we're going to look at the tail. We've got to look at both sides. Here's what the tail part means. His touch eases life's tensions. Come on now. That's good news. You know what? That's such good news. We need to take a seventh inning stretch. Stand to your feet and clap and say, God, thank you for easing the tension. Thank you, dear God, for your touch in my life. That's powerful. Man, that is powerful. On the flip side of the coin, you give all you have to God, and here's the beauty, God gives all he has to you. You don't have to give up, especially if you're here today and you feel your faith is all up to you because the fact of the matter is it's not. That's why we got to look at both sides of the coin. I mean, the beautiful thing about Christianity is God sets the standard and calls us to walk in that standard. Then God says, okay, now that you understand the standard, I'm going to coach you. I'm going to help you get there. And I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going I'm to lead you with compassion, with love, with kindness, with justice. I'm going to develop you. I'm going to help you. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, His divine power has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. That's good. Some things we need to understand about God's work now in us. We don't have to worry because God has all the power. He is all-powerful. Watch this. Philippians 2, 13 says, For it is God. Remember that. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The emphasis in that scripture is God. That's the the creator. Think of this. The creator of the universe, a God who is powerful enough to think a thought and it comes into existence. It's amazing. This is the God we serve and he is at work in us. Romans chapter 8 gives us an incredible insight on how God is working in us. In Romans 8, 26, it says the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Romans 8 and And 29 gives us more insight into his his call of who he is and what he wants to do in our life. Let me turn there for for just a moment because this is important. Romans 8, 29 says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many. So that is, that is a powerful statement that God has shared. In Romans 8, 34, it says this. So who is condemning you? Who's condemning you? Who is saying in your ear, hey, you know what? On Saturday, you were just getting ready to flip somebody off, punch somebody in the face. You lost it. And, and you think you're good enough? You think you deserve to stand in front of hundreds of people and talk about me, talk about the love that I have, talk about self-control, talk about working out your spirit. You're a, you're a sham. Why don't you, because you're not ready, why don't you call Alex and you tell him he needs to preach Sunday because you know what, you're, you're not good enough. Don't think those things didn't run through my mind. We hear voices that condemn us to say, well, you you know what? Look how many years you lived. What do you have to show for it? You have no value. You're a Christian, but you have no, you have no value. You know what? How many times have you asked God to forgive you and you keep doing the same? You keep sinning. You keep sinning. You you know what? You're never going to change. You're never going to change. 
this power, this working out your salvation, all this, stuff, all the effort, and you still are the same, you're not growing. I mean, look at, look at the last five years. You're no different than you were five years ago. How many sermons have you heard? How many scriptures have you read, read since then? You're a failure. You're a failure. And you know what? You're always getting stepped over at work. You work your butt off. You're supposed to be a Christian. Doesn't the Bible talk about favor? Where's your favor? It's because you're not good enough. You, you just, you're, you're not going to make it. And, and as we turn that coin, Paul knows this because he, he got ridiculed and ridiculed and ridiculed and ridiculed. And, and here's what he says through the power of the Holy Spirit. Who, who is it? Question mark. Who is it to condemn? It's not Jesus Christ. For there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ Jesus is the one who loved you, who loved me so much, knew our sin, past, present, and future, and still said, hey, Dale Donatio, I know what you're going to do on Saturday, but I still love you, forgive you. I want you to call on me. I want you to work out your salvation because I have diamonds and rubies in you. You're going to continue to preach the word of God. You're going to t- continue to grow this church. You're going to continue to make an impact in this community. You need to work out your salvation. Don't give up more than that. He says Christ was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God. He is interceding for us. Woo! So you have the Spirit of God. This is amazing. You have the Spirit of God, what we just read, is praying for you. The Son of God is also praying for you. The Spirit of God, the Bible says, is living in you. We just read God the Father is justifying you. Justifying you from the sin that is in you. It's not that you stay there. Because we're, we're what? With the other side of the coin, we're working out our salvation. We're reckoning. This is amazing. So he's working on our behalf, and that's why Philippians 2.13 says, both to will and to work for what? His good pleasure. That word works is energeo in the Greek. We get our word energy from it. You can translate it this way. It is God who is the energizer. Not you, not me. We saw in Ephesians 2, we can't do it by ourselves. So so how can Paul tell us to give all we have? Because we have a God, and he is energizing us to do what he has called us to do and what he has accomplished, his desire, his will for us to do, to live a powerful, productive life. It's amazing. When we begin to grasp this mindset, we can say, with Paul in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 where Paul says, I can do all things. As I'm working out my salvation, as I'm looking at both sides of the coin, God, I can do all things through you because you are the one who gives me strength. I am worthy only because of you. I am only righteous because of you. I'm just a man. I'm just a woman, but I'm going after that. I'm mining after those precious jewels that are in me, those gifts that you have planted in me. I'm not going to give up, God. I'm going to keep going. You give me the strength. You give me the power. And in return, it helps us grow deeper in him. And then we don't have to worry because God has a plan. We don't have to worry. He's willing and working. I mean, God wants to encourage us to will and work. He wants to give us a desire, and he wants to help us meet those desires. He gives us how? He gives us this this, uh, holy discontent. Remember we talked in the Beatitudes about hungering and thirsting for God, and then the Bible says when we hunger and thirst for God, we're not going to be satisfied. And really what that means is, I I want more of him, I want more of him, I want more of him. So no matter how much I get of the presence of God, I'm never satisfied. So I keep growing, I keep filling myself, I fail, I get up, I keep after him, after him, and after him. I'm telling you the truth about this. 
I had such a bad three days. And sometimes, again, I have a stick to myself, and I need to try to not do that. But right after I, slow, I took that pedal off the gas, I wanted to pull over my car and just throw up. I was so ashamed of myself. I just felt so guilty. I was like, you know, I, 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 I began to pray. I said, God, I'm, I am really sorry. I mean, it's just, it's a stinking game. It's just a car. My wife's got to get better. This was just an inconvenience. Someone was just, who kn- I don't know why they were driving like that. I, maybe they were having a worse day than me. Maybe they just found out their, their wife or their friend or them, they got cancer. Or maybe they were lost their job and they were getting their frustration out. I don't know. And, and what God does, he, he gives us this discontent with the level of our spirituality. Not condemning us, but saying, you know what? The Spirit lives in you. I live in you. And Dale with my help, you can get better. You can get better. There's more of you. You're you're better than that. And then, not not feeling guilty, now all that guilt is gone, and I just want to, because I love him, I just want to be better. I just want to grow more. I want to work on my weaknesses. I I, I say, God, and, and it's a joy to do it. You see what I'm saying? It's both sides of the coin. Do you realize that a part of the work of God is to make us literally sick of our own sin? We're sick of it. And he wants to move us from glory to glory to glory. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he's, Paul says, I do this that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. And, and Paul says, I want to become like him. So the more Paul yields himself to Christ, the more Christ works in him. Listen, if we crave that spiritual desire, God will propel us in that direction of of that desire and give us the ability to act. And then lastly here, the other thing it does is we must understand his pleasure. In the NASB it says this, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work. What? For his good pleasure. Why is God working in me? Why is God working in you? This is amazing. So that you and I can bring him pleasure. What an amazing statement. I mean, grasp that. We are talking about the God of the universe who can do anything he wants. And whenever and whatever he does, he does it perfectly. Perfectly. Yet Paul says, when God works in my life, he does it in such a way that an imperfect person like me can please a perfect God. He's working in me. And I'm, and I'm doing my work. I'm mining it out. This is absolutely incredible. How do we become men and women of God? We work out our, our salvation. We give it maximum effort. And at the same time, then God works in us. So let's say it this way. It takes all of him and all of us. It takes everything you are and it takes everything he is. And the result is your life and my life is transformed by the power and the might of Jesus Christ. Woo, that's good news. That is good news. What is God wanting to do in us and for us and turn us into this person? How can he work through you? How can, how can he work through that relationship, that, that ministry he wants you to be involved in, that wrong that, that he wants you to make right? It's taking both sides of this coin and being able to look at both sides of the coin. 